Okay, so we have one question right now. How, how about uh, start with, you know, Jack and Bum for, you know, very right. first questions. Sure, so perhaps Bam, uh, perhaps P Bum and Jack, you can read the question to us. Okay, this is the question that we collect from the chat. Um, online platform have a prominent role in providing students a lot of opportunities to comment on each other asynchronously and develop their writing. However, as a commentator student, some feel shy to give their friends comment while online. But, and those as a writer student, they, f they fear for being judged. As a teacher of writing, what should we handle this? Mm -hmm. mm, that's a good question. Um, well, there are different ways of dealing with this issue. Some students feel shy to, some people don't want to criticize other students and other students don't like to take criticism or they don't take it very well. And one thing we can do is to prepare students to give productive, helpful feedback, right? Um, and one thing that, that I, always remind my students of when they provide peer feedback is don't talk about you, but talk about how I feel, right? I read this text and I was confused by this sentence. It's better than your sentence is confusing, mm -hmm. right? So changing the tone, changing the attitude, focusing on the problem and your response, your confusion, rather than the writer's problem is a good starting point. Right. And you can also model feedback behavior uh, when you show them a sample text. And when you talk about it, you can say, well, in this case, I might say uh, I was confused by this first sentence because of the shift in the verb tense. And here's how I might replace this verb tense or something like that, right? So if you can identify, describe the problem without judging, being judgmental, right? If you said this, your tense use is horrible, nobody's gonna like it. But if you said, I was confused by this verb tense uh, because there was a shift and it would be easier if it was consistent, this verb and this verb, right? Um, that would be a much better way of providing suggestions and students can emulate how you talk. Or another thing, and this is something that I actually picked up from uh, a feedback from my teacher when I was a master's student, was I like how you describe this. The phrase, I like how, right? Now that gave me a great tool to talk about the strengths that I see in another person's writing. Like, so giving students the vocabulary, the sentence structure for productive feedback is something that we can do to prepare students. And another thing that we can do is to make the feedback session anonymous. Some platforms allows anonymous posting of texts mm -hmm. and some people allows anonymous commenting, right? And if you can use that, uh, the students can provide comments anonymously so that the, um, they don't have to worry about uh, getting into a negative relationship or compromising their relationships with their friends. Thank you so and, much. Yeah, I have another strategy, but I, maybe we can move on to... Oh, go, go, go on, go on. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So, so another strategy is to give students different roles. And I might assign different, you know, if you have five different grammar points that you want to cover, subject verb agreement, tenses, or uh, relative clause, prepositions, each person up, and then you divide students up into groups, and each group becomes expert, develop expertise by doing some research on these grammar points, and then they can present what they have learned. And then they can demonstrate, here's a sample sentence and here's how you 
character, right? And so, so they become more familiar with a certain aspect of grammar than other students. And then when students break into groups, each expert groups can be distributed into every group, student groups, feedback groups, so that there's always someone who is really knowledgeable about the use of prepositions or someone who is familiar with um, good at pointing out subject verb agreement errors. And then those people are in charge of taking care of these issues. So the feedback is not personal. They're just doing their job, right? And that distances them themselves from the regular personal relationships. So that's another strategy, assigning roles uh, so that students are performing their roles rather than themselves. Thank you so much, Professor Paul. Let's have the next question. All right, so for the next question, uh, how can we facilitate students' awareness of intercultural rhetoric when we teach online? Um, okay, so what do you mean by intercultural rhetoric in this case? Whoever asked this question. Yeah, perhaps we could invite this, the person who asked that question to perhaps, you know, elaborate what intercultural means so everyone would be aware of where you're coming from. Hello. Hi. Um, can you hear me, Professor? Um, yes, I can. Yeah, I asked this question. Uh, first of all, I would like to confess that um, I don't know what, what it means by um, intercultural rhetoric. And I think um, it is uh, important for um, students. So I'm interested, um, you know, to know how can we um, teach or um, promote uh, understandings about intercultural rhetoric in uh, writing class, especially mm -hmm. when we teach online. Mm. Okay. Um, well, intercultural rhetoric is an area of study and it's related to how people might um, use different strategies for communication depending on what they are used to, uh, the local conventions that they have developed. Um, and that's one understanding. And some students uh, in your classrooms might be used to communicating in a certain way or they are more familiar with certain genres, right? And when you are trying to teach students to write in another genre, uh, and if students seem confused by those differences, um, well, it might be useful to, uh, for students to, ref to reflect on why they communicate in a certain way in their own local communities and oftentimes we don't know we just you know our answers to how we write letters of recommendation is because everybody does it that way because i've seen other people do it this way right so when they see a new writing sample or a new task new genre um, students don't necessarily understand it, not because of the cultural differences or linguistic differences, but because the new genre and the new community that they're talking to is unfamiliar to them, right? So talking about why people communicate and what assumptions that particular community uh, seem to have and why the text is organized or presented in a certain way uh, could be a starting point. So rather than trying to explain it in terms of the difference between their local context and the new context, um, I would use the local context to raise the awareness of some of the assumptions that we have developed that are not questioned, and then help them uh, explore the context of writing. Uh, so that they understand why things are done in a certain way. And one of the reasons I think academic writing is really challenging for a lot of students is because they've never been an academic. 
they don't know why professors write. They don't know why professors communicate in a certain way. They don't, so, so it's not, the, no, not knowing the genre itself that's challenging, but not knowing how people's minds operate in academic contexts or certain professional contexts, that's uh, often a stumbling block for students, right? So when I teach academic writing, I often show them my own examples. And then I talk about why I chose this sentence here or why I chose to use a particular phra phrase in this context instead of another phrase. There's always a story behind decisions that we make, right? especially good writers. Now, good writers are deliberate writers. Good writers are people who make decisions about every aspect of writing in order to achieve their desired outcomes. Right? So novice writers struggle because they don't know what functions they want to perform and how they can perform those functions. Right? So talking about the context, talking about the assumptions, the nature of communication, and looking at the text to imagine why the writer may have written in a certain way would be a really good activity to raise the awareness. All right, thank you so much. Let's have the next question. This question is asking about Professor Paul's preference. What online delivery mode do you prefer, synchronous or, or asynchronous, and why? Um, so I was saying, the answer depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. Just, like, just as a good writer is a deliberate writer, a good teacher also has to be a deliberate teacher. We have to know what kind of learning we want to facilitate and then think about how we can facilitate it the best. So if, when, when I'm present, uh, providing feedback on student writing, I don't prefer write written feedback. I actually prefer face-to-face -face feedback. So as much as I can, even for a short period of time, I try to meet with students and then ask students what they are trying to do, what they are struggling with, and then I try to uh, understand what they're doing first and why they are doing it. And then based on their goals, I, would, I will try to provide suggestions so that I'm not the evaluator of their writing, but I'm a facilitator of what they want to accomplish. And there are times when I want students to uh, develop knowledge. For example, if there are, mm, let's see, different ways of organizing an argument. And if I want them to know about five different ways of organizing certain types of arguments, then I could talk to them, but talking to them is not, probably not the best way. You know, there are times for that, uh, that lectures are useful. I, you know, and I, I, I like lecturing because I can not only impart information, but I, I can also engage students. I can get their attention and I can gauge whether they're understanding something or not and then provide more information. So I do like synchronous activities as well. But if the goal is to help them understand and internalize five different ways of doing something, then it's probably much more effective for them to see a diagram or a list or uh, paragraphs explaining different types of organization and, and maybe with examples, right? Um, and then, so, so I have them do that, read the, the materials, see some examples, and then practice using those skills asynchronously. And then once they have done it, I might bring them into a synchronous environment and then maybe give them an overview or ask them, have them ask questions or have them demonstrate what they have learned and then exchange feedback or comments. 
Okay, I see a hand. Michael? Go ahead, Michael. Michael? Okay, I'm going to unmute you so you don't have to... Oh. Okay, can you hear there me you now? Go. Yes, I can. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, the uh, many star and ongoing ideas. Um, I really like um, the way you share us about uh, have showing empathy to our students, which is uh, maybe it's not your field as a uh, maybe it's not because you're not from philosophy. I don't know from the philosophy, but but uh, I really like the way you uh, show us. Hello, can you hear me? Can Can you speak louder? Yeah, I think I need to. Hello, can you can can you can you hear me now? That's a lot better. All right, now, okay, um, now I'm supervising a uh, term paper uh, writing with my students. And then most of the uh, difficulties and challenges were to finding the, um, uh, the specific topic. Do you have any suggestions uh, to my students? Because I have uh, taught them to read a lot of previous uh, studies, but I don't think uh, maybe you have um, a more ideas and then second question was uh, do you have any like more suggestions to, to my students in, uh, in, in in writing their term paper research uh, during this pandemic uh, issues thank you mm -hmm. what, what kind of course is it uh, it's a uh, is it the, the um, last term paper for last semester from from students can kind of the thesis. What what is the course about? Oh, it's a uh, English education. English, English edu education. Uh, yeah, writing in English education. Uh, is okay. it uh, writing? So it's a writing course. Writing course, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what what's the purpose of assigning the final paper? Uh, to create a uh, final paper. Okay, and what for for what what's the purpose of creating the final paper? For academic writing, it's for uh -huh. uh, to deliver their idea about uh, about issue in English education. Mm -hmm. So so they need to learn how to write about English education. Yes, uh, it's like a, a research paper. Uh, mini mm -hmm. research paper. Okay, and so, so the topic is going to be about language education? Yes. Okay, and how about, um, well, what kind of research paper are you thinking of? Are you thinking of review papers, critical reviews, or are you thinking of empirical research papers or synthesis? Yeah. Uh, it's a literature review, it's a synthesis paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, um, something you might do is to have students imagine what the post-COVID-19 teaching situation is going to be like, uh, and right. then to design or, or to come up with uh, best practices. Uh, now it's premature, uh, but because it's premature, we don't have all the answers. Students will have lots of room for experimentation and mm -hmm. it's hard to plagiarize because nobody has the right answer or final answer at this point. Yeah. Right? Does that help? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that does really help. And then uh, talking about the experimental, uh, we're not sure whether we we're going to open the school uh, for uh, for uh, in the future. Do you think if if they conduct kind of uh, experimental research, it could be on? Can I just try to make them to 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 conduct a study in the online uh, context, or because we're not sure about because we usually conduct the on the offline mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Right. So yeah. You know, I actually did a webinar on research, doing research in the post uh, or COVID-19 pandemic situation. Oh. 
And one of the suggestions that I made was to have students do, you know, we, because we can't do face-to-face -face data collection, you know, mm. maybe conduct a survey research um, mm. online or interviews using Zoom or other types of uh, synchronous technology. Mm. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you, Michael, for that question. Let's have the next question, Jack. Okay, for the next question, how can we ensure that when studying online, students will learn as efficiently as when they study in the classroom? Hmm. Um, I don't know. It's really hard to ensure that students learn the same way. And it's probably not possible. So instead of thinking about replicating the classroom situation exactly as it has been, maybe we can think about what aspects of learning can we, can we emphasize or can we add to our repertoire given the enhanced environment? What are the strengths of the online technology that uh, can help us to uh, be effective in ways that we never imagined before. And how can, you know, if there are things that are essential in face-to-face -face situation, then how can we, uh, well, pass and fail is one simplified grading option. And for low stakes assignment, you know, the small assignments that we provide in order to build uh, competencies, I think pass fail is a great tool to encourage students to do it to a certain level so that they are, their work is good enough so that they have uh, engaged in the learning process, but not necessarily making it so challenging or so high stakes that they are intimidated by it, right? And so, so it could be a series of pass fail that accumulates over time. That's one way of doing it. Uh, but if for other types of learning, uh, we may have need to be a little more complicated. I don't want to make it a lot more complicated, but maybe having two or three important learning points, objectives, and then for each of the categories, have them um, show them where the cutoff is between not adequate to good enough, and if they are excelling, if they are doing a particularly good job, find a way to give them extra points or a star or uh, above average or, or above expectations or something to acknowledge their successes. And by the way, when you have the three-way breakdown, you don't necessarily have to give them points for being excellent. You can, you know, good enough is good enough. You earn one point. If you don't do it, zero. But if you are excellent, you get the mark of excellent, but you don't have to get two points. It's just a way of showing students that they have excelled in this area. Great job. It's an acknowledgement. It's a badge of honor. Sometimes that's good enough to motivate students to do well. And it also depends on how the relationship that the teachers have established with their students. And um, if in some cases, the teacher can motivate students to do anything without even giving them any grades or assessment. Uh, if that's the case, great. But if students are really demotivated for whatever reasons, um, maybe they, they are not um, academically inclined. And if, that's the, and, and if the grade does help motivate them, then I would use them um, to recognize their strengths and achievements and their efforts. There's a lot more to be said about grading, but that's just one aspect of it. Thank you so much, Professor Paul. There's another question, but I would try to um, interpret it the way I think it, it means. So the question goes, regardless of situation, writing teacher development is vital. Um, it says here that in the post-COVID-19 pandemic, do you think that the writing, um, the, the online writing teacher development course would be 
important? And if so, how will we emphasize it? How will we um, perhaps design it? Hmm. So I'm, I'm assuming that the person who asked this question is directed to teachers who are teaching writing. So in mm -hmm. order for them to perhaps facilitate their students' writing abilities, teachers themselves be, must be well equipped with the tools in teaching, the write, teaching writing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, this is a big question. And well, t teacher, writing teacher education is important, uh, period, right? It, it's something that hasn't been done uh, in many educational contexts. Uh, I'm seeing more and more people who, are, who have formally learned to teach writing, but it's not available everywhere. Uh, so I think it's a good trend that uh, people are beginning to think about the need to prepare teachers for the challenge of teaching writing. And whether we do it online or offline, again, uh, we have to do whatever we can um, that's available to us. Uh, but it is important to think about what teachers need to know and then to provide uh, the knowledge and skills and experience uh, that will help them succeed as teachers. Now, the exact content of the workshop and the course is going to depend on uh, what the teachers have already done and uh, what experience they already have. It depends on whether it's an in-service program or pre-service program, whether it's a program for, a teacher who, uh, for teachers who are teaching in a new kind of curriculum versus teachers who have been teaching in a particular curriculum. Um, so I can't really uh, come up with one size fits all solution. Uh, but from the very beginning, I think uh, one of the good starting point is to have teachers write something themselves. You know, if we are not, if we don't have a lot of experience writing, if we don't have, have lots of strategies, then it's really hard to teach well. So gaining some experience as writers uh, is important. And another thing that's important is to maybe observe other people's teaching and not so much to evaluate other people's strategies, but to reflect on their own teaching by looking at other people's strategies. Because not, a good teaching is not the same for everyone. I have my strengths and preferences. Other people have their preferences and strengths. And by watching other people, sometimes I can be confident that, okay, I'm doing something that this teacher is not doing, or I might see a new strategy and I might think about, okay, does this fit my teaching style? Does it fit my relationship with the student, right? So it helps me reflect and grow as a teacher. Um, again, the focus should be on myself rather than other people. For, for the teacher preparation course that I teach regularly, one of the important components, uh, aside from the readings, um, and about different aspects of teaching writing is the ongoing mentoring and discussions. So I meet with them semi-regularly uh, once a week for the first half of the semester and then every other week. And then I give them a chance to reflect on their experience, talk about things that they have noticed, and I might give them comments and then have them ask questions. And that tends to work much better than just giving them lectures or curriculum that they have to follow. Because if I tell them, this is what you need to do, they try to fit my model and it may not work very well. But if they are already practicing something, you know, their own reflections of how things are going and what they want to improve is going to motivate them to do better. And then at that point, once we have identified those moments and, uh, aspects of teaching, then I can talk about what other people have done or what I have done to give them more resources. Thank you so much, Professor Paul. I think we still have two more questions. Let's start with Jack. Okay. Okay. Um, Professor Paul mentioned that indirect feedback is better than direct feedback. Um, 
What about students who have poor English language proficiency? What do you think? Which one is better between direct and indirect feedback? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, indirect feedback is better in terms of facilitating students' development because it makes them think. But if you are looking for immediate results, then direct feedback is better. And direct feedback can teach students something because it's a form of input. And students may not understand it or be able to internalize it immediately, but it give, gives them something to think about. Uh, and when they see the same kind of sentence structure or same kind of grammar points in the future, uh, your example might facilitate their awareness. Right. So I don't think direct feedback is ineffective, particularly, but um, they have direct and indirect feedback have different functions and different effects on student learning. So once again, the tools are tools. What's important is to think about what, learn, what kind of learning we want to facilitate and then to choose the best tool to make that learning happen. Thank you so much, Professor Paul. Let's have the last question, Bom. Which aspect of online writing teacher development would you think are important to cover? And the participant also give the example um, of the writing teacher development, like the way to provide the teacher corrective feedback students' paper and ways to further student engagement in activity. So the question again, which aspect of online writing teacher development do you think are important to cover? Mm -hmm. Well, my answer also is pretty much the same. It depends. It depends on what the teacher is already doing, what the teacher is already aware of, and how the teacher wants to develop in the future. Um, so if it's with an exper experienced group of teachers, you know, um, I might choose a particular issue that many teachers are struggling with and then just focus on it. Um, but what I focus on depends on the particular group of teachers that I work with. And if it's a beginning teachers, then focusing on one or two aspects of teaching is not necessarily a good idea. So I would try to cover all different aspects of teaching from course design to understanding student characteristics to uh, designing assignments and providing feedback, facilitating feedback and helping students develop strategies for writing processes and having um, how to raise the awareness of the context, genre, and audience. And then um, an overview of issues and practices in assessing student writing. So it would be a fairly comprehensive package uh, for beginning teachers. All right, thank you so much, Professor Paul. I would actually say that, um, you know, this session is truly a breath of fresh air as it quite centers on criticality, compassion, and creativity. And perhaps everyone would agree how enlightening this talk is for all of us, especially to language teachers. And once again, we would like to, to really thank you for your wonderful talk. And we thank everyone for actively participating today. And we would like to invite you all to our next um, webinar session, which is happening on the 22nd of June. So from, from writing instruction, we're now moving to language assessment. So our next speaker will tackle, am I qualified to be a language tester? Towards a, a conceptual model of the development of language assessment, literacy across stakeholders. And our speaker will be Assistant Professor Dr. Shen Yuan from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the USA. So once again, Professor Paul, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your insightful talk. Thanks for the opportunity. Good luck everyone and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in general, I think, you know, we all, we all are going through 
a challenging situation. Uh, you know, everybody's situation is different and, you know, it's changing almost every day. We are learning new things, learning to do things in a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a lot of stress and, you know, it's, it's a very slow process as well when we are learning to do this, you know, even the familiar things in a different way. Um, so um, I hope we, we will survive. We will survive together well, mm. by sharing insights, by being there for each other uh, and you know, do whatever you can to stay healthy and keep other people healthy and we will persist. Beautiful message. Thank you so much, Professor Paul. And thank you everyone for still sticking with us. It was great to see everyone. And those of you who didn't speak up, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for the talk and have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Good night.